Okay, good morning and thank you everyone for joining us for our National Recreation Parks Month webinar. Today we will be hearing about wildlife viewing from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Our first speaker will be Jerry Lindsay, who has been with the FWC for over 20 years and serves as the Director of the Public Access and Wildlife Viewing Services Office. Our second speaker will be Ann Glick, who has also been with FWC for 16 years and serves as the Wildlife Viewing Program Administrator. There will be a question and answer portion at the end of the presentation, so please hold all questions until then. And I want to remind everybody that we are recording this webinar, and this will be available to view on YouTube on Friday. So with that, Jerry, if you'd like to take it away. Thank you, Katie. I really appreciate you inviting us to participate in the webinar series. And um, thanks, everyone who's tuning in. Uh, appreciate your interest. And it's great to celebrate National Parks and Recreation Month by talking about wildlife viewing. Um, I am, as Katie said, the director of the public access, we call ourselves the Public Access Services Office for short. Um, and we, uh, along with my colleague Anne, uh, run uh, wildlife viewing programs for the public. We uh, develop public access physical and programmatic uh, enhancements and amenities on our wildlife management area system, which is one of the largest wildlife management area systems in the country with almost 6 million acres of land. And we um, offer a great uh, number of interpretive programs and uh, citizen science and other kind of volunteer uh, programs to get the public involved in helping us with our wildlife viewing, or excuse me, our wildlife conservation mission. Um, that the agency has. And um, so again, thank you for having us. And we're going to uh, talk a little bit about wildlife viewing. So, spe so specifically, excuse me, um, what is it? You know, what are we talking about when we talk about wildlife viewing? Why it's popular? Why it's important? What benefits it provides? Um, to individuals and to our communities. And um, we'll end in, with Anne talking about how we can work together to make wildlife viewing opportunities better uh, in our communities. And hopefully you are uh, in, interested in, in some of that information and we'll be happy to follow up with you um, in the future. So when we're talking about wildlife, we're not, we're talking about birds and fish and all the different kinds of species that live in Florida in natural environments that can be found in urban and suburban and, and out in pristine areas like state parks and wildlife management areas and national parks. We don't, we're not talking about farm animals like goats and chickens and cows or our domestic pets. Um, and sometimes that's a little confusing to folks. And so I always like to start out by um, getting us clear about what kind of animals we're talking about um, being interested in and getting out to enjoy. Um, and even when we're talking about wildlife uh, in the context of wildlife viewing, we're not talking about zoos and things, but rather going out into um, natural areas, intentionally observing or photographing wildlife, or hopefully maintaining wildlife habitat around our homes um, to attract um, wildlife by planting native plants or um, providing water and things like that shelter um, for the primary purpose of, of viewing wildlife. So um, being out hiking or paddling or whatever and, and enjoying the wildlife that's around us is a wonderful enhancement, but it's not what we're talking about. We're talking about uh, what happens when people specifically go out with a primary purpose uh, of finding and viewing wildlife. So why is it important? We put a lot of effort, we have an entire program uh, focused on wildlife viewing, and it's um, because our, you know, this is our mission as an agency to conserve fish and wildlife for their long-term well-being, but also for the benefit of people. And frankly, the the long the conservation of fish and wildlife won't happen unless people perceive and appreciate a benefit of fish and wildlife habitat and fish and wildlife because they won't 
um, support those efforts. And we hope that by creating together um, opportunities to get out and enjoy wildlife and learn about wildlife and take up to stewardship actions on behalf of wildlife, um, we maintain the benefits that we'll talk about today. We'll have vibrant communities and economies, which wildlife viewing helps support and a, a greater uh, health and well-being of our citizenry. So why is Florida particularly special for wildlife viewing? We're actually one of the number one state in the country that attracts people to view wildlife from all over the, all over the US and all over the globe, frankly. Um, and it's because we have such an unusual uh, geography with that peninsular shape of the state, uh, ranging from temperate to subtropical um, climate zones, that huge coastline, our wetlands, or many different kinds of habitats that in turn support a rich diversity of wildlife species. And we have um, an incredible number of species in Florida, um, more than almost anywhere else in the country. And in particular spots, hot spots they're called, um, we have diversity that's like nowhere else in the globe. And just just to the west of Tallahassee, where I'm speaking to you from in the Apalachicola River are, um, is one of those global hotspots. And in particular, we have um, about 300, I'm looking at my notes here, 300 plants, 40 vertebrates and 400 invertebrates, think of insects and butterflies and things like that that are found nowhere else on the planet. And we're also located along the eastern uh, part of the country in the in the Atlantic, what's called the Atlantic Flyway. So for birds uh, that migrate down to Florida for the winter or through Florida on their way further south, um, that adds to the wonderful diversity of, of um, birds and other wildlife that we can see. A lot of those special um, species that I talked about that are that are endemic, in other words, found nowhere else, are particularly at risk because they have real special um, habitat requirements. And in Florida, with the development pressure that we have with degradation of habitat, um, and with changing climate conditions, rapidly changing climate conditions, a lot of those species are at risk. So making those connections, and that stewardship for wildlife is especially important if we want to uh, achieve that conservation mission. So again, um, looking forward to working with you to make wildlife viewing opportunities uh, in your communities. So changing gear just a little bit uh, into why people uh, are attracted to wildlife and, and why they want to uh, be and, and are attracted to nature actually. Um, is this notion, this concept of biophilia. Biophilia is a Greek word, which means love of living things. And there is uh, several uh, very prominent scientists in the United States that uh, over decades have um, fully fleshed out this concept and done really uh, quite amazing research into our innate need for exposure to the natural world and, uh, and living things. And um, this underlies a lot of why we, why we want to be outdoors and why the outdoors is good for us. And I've heard my colleagues at DEP call the outdoors vitamin green, and that is absolutely true. And it's borne out by studies um, that, that show the health effects of uh, exposure and the, and the need actually for being outdoors and um, being surrounded by um, beauty. Discovery, 
novelty, you know, ooh, what's that? Where does that trail go around the corner? Uh, what is that bird I hear? You know, that uh, look how beautiful this place is, that beautiful bird, whatever it is, the experiences of awe and, and attraction. That's my grandson there in the picture with his dad. Um, and when we have these experiences, they take us out of our everyday world and um, the cares that we have and the pressures that we feel. And numerous studies show that um, walking in a forest, for example, um, has a measurable effect on cortisol, which is a, a stress hormone in our bodies. That exposure to bird song reduces blood pressure and it results in self-reported better mental health, less anxiety, et cetera. Hospital patients who are recovering from surgery or illnesses whose windows look out over a natural environment recover faster than those that are looking out over the parking lot. So immersion in nature um, is good for us. We need it. And I think we see that um, motivations for wildlife um, viewing align well with the general motivations for outdoor recreation and they rest firmly on this you know, innate need that the biophilia hypothesis, uh, fancy word, um, uh, explains for us. And you can see for relaxation, to enjoy the scenery, for health, to be with friends and family, to be fit for my mental well-being, to be close to nature, that we recognize those. I don't know that the everyday person would call that biophilia, but they recognize that in terms of their motivations of why they wanna get outdoors. So it's not surprising that wildlife viewing is very popular. In fact, it's almost the most popular activity in Florida. This comes from the State Comprehensive Outdoor Recreation Plans Participation Survey that was done in 1617 um, and has been done every five years uh, for the past several um, cycles. Then it looks at people's self-reported um, motivations and participation rates and what they desire. And I'm going to talk a, uh, quite a bit about what uh, people tell us relative to wildlife viewing from this study. So you can see that 61% of the people say they go out specifically for the purposes of viewing wildlife. That's how the question was asked. And it ranks above uh, going to the beach, um, about everything else than, than going for a walk. And this has been a consistent finding and it's actually increased over time, 12% over when the survey was done in 2011. And during the pandemic, we were talking before the webinar started, Katie and Ann and I, we see a lot of increase in outdoor recreation and not surprisingly also in wildlife viewing and wildlife viewing around the home. So in other studies, and one that we've just been participating in with Virginia Tech and, and, and states around the country, it's not, quite, it's not published quite yet, we asked people what they wanted to see when they went out wildlife viewing. And birds were number one, um, but land mammals came, and this is, this is Florida data, came um, not, um, not far behind. And marine mammals, which we have in abundance in Florida, were um, not far behind that. Um, many people still have interests beyond those. Um, reptile viewing, herp, uh, herping, as young people call it, is, is very popular among young people and others around the state. Insects, don't think about mosquitoes, think about butterflies, think about dragonflies. Um, are also very popular amongst segments of our population. And even 20% are interested in, in getting out and, and learning about and seeing amphibians and fish. And if you put on uh, goggles and go for a swim in freshwater springs or uh, around reefs in Florida, you would understand why, because the, um, they're often quite beautiful. In the SCORP participation study, going back to that, um, 
one of the questions asks Floridians what they wanted in, in terms of amenities in their communities. And in the top five most desired amenities in every single region of the state were nature trails, interpretive trails, and wildlife viewing overlooks. So this also, this desire to get out and experience nature and see wildlife um, is expressed in the, the opportunities and the physical amenities that people want to see. This particular site is on the Big Bend Wildlife Management Area just south of Tallahassee and Taylor County. It's a beautiful place to get out and see wildlife. And people like the being led to places where they can um, see wildlife, have it interpreted for them, and, um, and learn about it. But there's barriers, obviously, to getting outdoors, as we all know. Um, and from, again, the participation study, the SCORP participation study, um, not knowing where to go, and we see this in many other uh, research studies that we've looked at, not having anyone to go with, feeling like things, I'm too busy and it's too far, um, it costs too much. Uh, it might be unsafe. This is particularly a concern among women and people of color. Or the places around me are not well maintained. They're full of trash. I was actually really surprised in the open-ended comments to see how common that particular concern was. So we have some work to do as a community to make sure that our public lands and, the, and specifically the um, the trails and amenities that we provide are well cared for um, so that that doesn't become a barrier for people getting outdoors. And trash, frankly, is a, is a danger to wildlife. And I think it adds to that, maybe that feeling of is, this might be unsafe or sketchy place. So a key strategy is, is sites that are well distributed, close by, they don't have to be perfect wildlife viewing places, but they're, um, they're, they have natural habitat, they have the opportunity, they, we tell people about them, they're accessible. When I'm, when I'm talking about accessible here, I'm talking about both those aspects of accessibility, that they're well known and that they're um, available to all, and they're perceived as safe um, and low cost and well cared for. We will surmount a lot of the barriers that maybe keep people from getting out and enjoying our, our um, natural world. And when we're doing that, when we're developing those amenities, this isn't from any study, this is from us saying that it's important to design sites um, and manage them, uh, locate them in ways that we provide great opportunities, but we do it in ways that are responsible so we don't um, disturb wildlife or um, uh, create conditions that uh, impair their ability to go about their, their um, everyday needs of, of feeding and reproducing. So one of the ways that we can do that is by providing good interpretation of what they're going to see, redirecting people's desires to get too close, because that's one of the things that, that causes problems. People want to see what that is. That's why binoculars and scopes and things like that are so important. But we can also encourage people in interpretation to stand back and observe their natural behavior, to learn how to recognize when they are disturbing wildlife by alerting, um, uh, recognizing the signs of being alerted to your behavior. If a, if a bird, for example, looks up from feeding or does that kind of thing, you're too close. You need to back up or be still and be quiet. Those kinds of things are important in, um, in developing sites um, that, that work well for both people and wildlife. And we have in the resources a whole list resource slides at the end, um, guidelines for how to, how to do that well. So we're going to switch gears a little bit. And I've kind of told you why, you know, why is wildlife viewing important? Well, what benefits it provides to people, that vitamin green aspect, what people want and desire, and how we can begin to help to deliver that. And now we're going to talk a little bit about how we can work together um, uh, to take advantage of the programs that we have and resources that we have to create experiences and opportunities. So I'm going to 
let my colleague Ann Glick, oops, um, take take it over from here. Ann. Thank you, Jerry, and thank you, Katie. Um, my name is Ann Glick. I'm the Wildlife Viewing Program Administrator here uh, for Florida Fish and Wildlife. As Jerry mentioned, we're in the Public Access Services Office within FWC. What I'm going to focus on uh, for the next 10, 15 minutes is an overview of our, F our wildlife viewing programs and how you can interface with those programs and then also resources that we have available to help you with any existing wildlife viewing programs or resources that you can use to build additional wildlife viewing events or educational programs in your area. So in my first slide here, it's just a representation of um, our website, which is found at myfwc.com slash viewing. And one of the things that you can find on our website is kind of the how-to. How do you go birding? How do you view butterflies? How do you do that ethically? As Jerry said, our goal is to make sure that we're not killing our golden goose. We know that wildlife viewing is a huge economic impact for the state of Florida in the upper almost triple digits uh, billion dollars. But we don't want to kill the golden goose that is providing that economic impact. So how can we help wildlife viewers in Florida and coming into Florida be ethical in their viewing? Um, things that you can share to what you need to know before you go wildlife viewing. How can you learn um, animal signs? You might not see the animals, but there's definitely signs out there of what animals have been present. So we do have this vast online resource. It's at myfwc.com slash viewing. It also includes, as you work through that site and kind of explore that site, and I would encourage everybody to do that. It also includes some research and data on wildlife viewers in Florida and visitors coming into Florida. So there's a, a series of um, Florida-based and national research that is up online. And it also has some resources for wildlife viewing practitioners, those that are actually doing programs. So once again, I encourage you to look around myfwc.com slash viewing and see what resources are there. One way that we can work together and that you can help us is on that uh, wildlife viewing site, we are in the midst of kind of giving it a refresh, kind of giving it a, a facelift. So I am setting up a series of online survey-based focus groups. So if you would like us, if you would like to be part of helping us look at our website and look at what you like, what you don't like, what you think is missing, what you would love to see added. And that can be from a wildlife viewer perspective, or it can be part of a state agency or perspective. You know, you're a, you work a practitioner, you're working in wildlife viewing. If you're interested in that, at the end, I'll put my um, uh, email in the chat. Please feel free to reach out to me. Okay, Jerry. Sorry, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> So, of course, our uh, flagship program is the Great Florida Birding and Wildlife Trail. Um, some familiar names on the webinar today, so I know many of you are probably familiar with the Birding and Wildlife Trail. Uh, it's been in existence for 23 years now. It was first thought of and uh, started to grow in 1999, and then our first uh, section was launched in 2000. It is a collection of over 500 sites, 513 to be exact. These sites are selected for their exceptional or unique wildlife viewing opportunities. And they are selected for their ability to allow viewers to come to that site and do it with the um, with limited um, disturbance to that wildlife and to that habitat. And it is supported by a 
a series of over 2000 wayfinding signs that are located throughout the state. And Jerry, flip to the next one. Thank you, Jerry. You see our wayfinding sign, that iconic uh, brown and white wayfinding sign that I'm sure you've all seen. Um, research has shown us that they are vitally important to viewers, not only Floridians, but viewers coming into the state. In fact, 86% of all trail users based on now two um, research projects use those signs to make their travel decisions. So they are seeing the sign and they're either saying, yep, that's where I wanna go. That's a good wildlife viewing site or they are coming back later when they have time to visit the site. So they're vitally important. Um, we laugh at one point, we thought, of course, you know, GPS on your phone, we don't need them, um, but that's not the case. Viewers really depend on those signs, not necessarily anymore to navigate to the site, but as branding to know that those are the best wildlife viewing sites in Florida. Other materials that are associated with the Great Florida Birding and Wildlife Trail. This past spring, um, we were able to create brand new guides. Our trail is split into four regions and we have four brand new um, Great Florida Birding and Wildlife Trail guides. These guides are all inclusive. They include every site on the trail, descriptions of those sites, viewable species on those sites any amenities that those sites might have that contribute to your experience, and then a series of maps that um, ID where those sites are located. Online, our trail site has a standalone, our trail has a standalone website, it's floridabirdingtrail.com. You can also find additional resources. We have an interactive trip planner that allows you to put in some parameters, what bird you wanna see, what amenities you wanna see. Um, are you going to the east? Are you going to the south? And it will bring up the trail sites that fit the parameters that you've chosen. Our site descriptions are also on uh, the website. And then that website, that site description links to whatever, whoever is the owner of that birding trail. The birding trail is made up of federal properties, state properties, county, local, and a few even private properties. So it has um, all range of, of types of landowners. Okay, Jerry. So another program that we have is our Wings Over Florida program. This is a program that rewards individual accomplishments in viewing birds and butterflies. So for many of us, we like to keep lists. We like to keep a list of what we see throughout our viewing experience. Um, many of you might have seen the, the movie, The Big Year, kind of brought life listing um, to the forefront. Um, people like to know and, and challenge themselves to see more and more species. Well, our Wings Over Florida rewards that. It is um, a series of certificates that as you see more and more birds, you can get more and more certificates. Uh, bird certificates start at 25 and go all the way up to 350. We also have butterfly certificates now that start at um, 20 and go up to 180 butterfly certificates. So that's a life list. So what you've seen in your lifetime. We added to our Wings Over Florida program a big year. There is a big year every year for um, the American um, Birding Association does their, their annual big year. It was the basis of the movie that came out about, oh, it's probably been 10 years now. Um, but this is a way that you can challenge yourself every year. How many different birds or how many different butterflies are you seeing in a calendar year from January through December? Um, you can 
Um, challenge yourself to try to get better every year. Uh, big years are getting more and more popular. I'm not sure if anybody had seen this year, a young woman from Texas beat the record with 726 birds um, throughout the year. I think her name was Kelsey owned, forgetting her name. I'm sorry, I'm having a senior moment. But out of the thousand birds that are in the United States, she was able to see 726 in one calendar year. So what can you see in Florida? And we have individual big year certificates for every year. So every year you can get a new certificate that lists how many species you've seen. Along with that, you get a button that has your big year and then a couple other little pieces of swag. Um, we do it both for the birds and we also have the only big year for butterflies in the United States. So you can also keep a butterfly list per year. Thank you, Jerry, we'll move on. So how can we help you? We have multiple avenues to promote and to push out information about your sites and your events. We have the GFBWT, the Great Florida Birding and Wildlife Trail Kite Tales, and let's see if I can add this. Okay, I just put a link in the chat for the Kite Tales, how to subscribe to Kite Tales. But at each monthly Kite Tales, we list events that are going on in the next uh, one to three months. And we also highlight if your site or if you're associated with the trail site, we also highlight um, different sites every month. So if you're interested in having your site highlighted, just reach out to us and we can work on adding that site to our Kite Tales um, list. We also have social media accounts. We have Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram. We can push content out through our social channels about your sites and your events. So just reach out to us um, with information that you would like us to include in those outlets. Um, talked about um, specifically putting out information about your site, but if you want to increase advertising, birding and wildlife viewing activities in your community, on your site, we can help you with not only identification of uh, the birds and the wildlife that tourists would be interested in seeing in your area, but help you gather up the photos that you can use and help you with text that would draw those wildlife viewers to the area. Um, Wings Over Florida is also a partner uh, program. We can uh, provide you with training on how to initiate Wings Over Florida in your area at your site. We can provide you educational materials on how you can teach birding, how you can teach butterfly, watching to um, novices. We can provide you with a packet that contains the first level certificates that you can give out to your participants. Um, and then we can provide you with information, just other educational information, how to teach ID. How do you teach bird ID to someone who's unfamiliar with how you look at a bird, find it in a, in a bird guide and how you kind of go through the thought process of identifying what that bird or butterfly is. So we have those partner resources that are available to you to use at your site. And I believe that is it for my slides. And I believe, Jerry, you're taking- yep, I am, thank you, Anne. Um, and hopefully, uh, you know, if we have questions about how to 
um, engage in any of those, we'll be happy to uh, take those. Um, I, we're ending with uh, a series of slides. Just wanted to draw your attention to these. I uh, referred to several of the, the research studies that we talked about. I forgot to put in the Nature of Americans, but if you Google Nature of Americans, it also provides you with, um, uh, there's a Florida study and it provides you with really fascinating information about um, people and their uh, relationship to nature, what they're um, looking for uh, in that very comprehensive, uh, both state of Florida and national study. Um, I mentioned some of the design guidelines and making sure that when we're um, designing sites um, and trails that we're thinking about wildlife. And these two resources are good places to start. And of course, if you have more detailed questions, when you get into those kind of things, we're, we're happy to uh, help answer questions as well. And then there are links to the resources that, that Anne talked about um, in her portion of the presentation. And so we're happy now to um, hear any questions that you might have. Thank you both so much for those presentations. Thank you, Katie. And Jerry. Um, so yeah, we'd like to open it up for questions now. Uh, you can either unmute or write in the chat box. And I think we've got one thing. So Diana said, please add the FWC bird and wildlife site that has the 513 trails. So the, the birding trail is <laughs> not a trail. It's a series of sites. It's, it's really confusing. We, it's a virtual trail. It's a virtual trail. It. Um, so we have 513 sites. A site would be a state park, a county park, a national wildlife refuge. And of course, on those sites then within the, the trail, you would have multiple walking and hiking trails. So it is, it is that if you go through, you could kind of trace around all the trails, but we have 513 sites. If you go to the, the yep. floridaburningtrail.com, uh, you'll see immediately um, all the different sites in the state, and then you can um, drill into any particular site that you're interested in finding out more about. That's floridaburningtrail.com? That's correct, and that was in the resource slide. Okay. Uh, Penny asked, how do you get the new revised physical guides, the printed ones and not the online ones? Good question. Um, there, are, there are a couple ways. If you are a trail site that has a visitor center, we can um, send you a small supply of those guides for your visitor center along with a rack card that has information on how individual um, tourists and visitors can order the guides. But if you go on my Florida birding trail to the guides, there is a link on there that takes you over to our online publication order system. And you can um, order individual guides from that, that point. If you want a bulk order for a visitor center or site, you can reach out to me and I can get those mailed to you. Thanks, Anne. And while other people are getting questions together, I just had a couple of questions for you all as well. Um, do you all have a newsletter that folks can sign up for? Okay. Yes, you can. Um, in the link to um, get the site information of all the trails that we talked about just a few minutes ago. Yes, we do have our kite tails. And I had added that in the chat um, a few minutes ago. So that will take you to our Gov Delivery. There's a link. We use Gov Delivery. Uh, that will take you to the link to sign up to use, um, to um, sign up for the Kite Tales. We do have another um, 
newsletter that's not public facing. It is for tourism, nature-based tourism. It's called Catch the Wild Tourist. It's focused on uh, practical tips and information for organizations that are promoting and using nature-based recreation, wildlife viewing um, as part of their overall tourism offering for their area. If you are in that arena and you would like to be added to the Catch the Wild Tourist, the easiest way is to reach out to me with your name, your title, and your email, and I can add that to that list. Since it's not public facing, it's not um, available on our website. So I would just need your email and your, um, your name and your, your uh, title, and I can get you added to that. It will come from constant contact. It does not, it comes out of our foundation, not out of the myfwc.com. Gotcha, thanks, Ann. And Doug Alderson asked, what are the top species people generally want to see? <laughs> we were, Doug, we were going to ask that question of, uh, of folks who were here. Um, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to turn the question around and ask you um, what you think is one of the top 20 uh, bird species. And then I'll answer some more of your question. And if you guess correctly, we'll give you a valuable prize. <laughs> oh, so we have <laughs> one guess in the, oh, we've got, we've got, we've got several, several. okay. <laughs> oh, we've, we've got a cut. A and bunch. I can't see the chat, unfortunately. So Katie, I'm going to rely on you to yep. just shout out some of them. <laughs> if you are interested in, in getting, I'm, I'm kind of tongue in cheek with my valuable prize. We have, we'll send um, anybody who's interested if they wanna put their, uh, their um, mailing address in the chat for Katie, if you direct that to her, um, we'll be happy to send you a, a bird checklist if you're interested. Yeah, and whenever you wanna direct um, chat me, you in the chat, you can click on the option where it says everyone and just select my name and it can go directly to me. Okay. Um, so some of the guesses we have are roseates, um, spoonbill roseates, and then that was from Penny. And then Doug said purple gallinules. And then Laura Donaldson said great blue heron. Nancy Norton said burrowing, uh, burrowing owls. Mm -hmm. And then we had another guest for Rosie at Spoonbill. Yep. Doug came back with Painted Bunting. Yep. <laughs> uh, Robin Birdsong, uh, Swallowtail Kites. And um, let's see. Oh, I've just, I think that's all the guesses so far. Okay. Well, um, the ro Rosie at Spoonbill, Spoon Purple Gallinu, Burring House, Painted okay. Buntings, and Swallowtail Kites are all correct. So, and scrub jay so oh, yeah. oh i didn't hear scrub jay we yep. just we just got two more uh laura Dolan said said northern cardinal and doug alderson said scrub jay yeah scrub jay um northern cardinals and great blue herons are beautiful birds they're more widespread in other states and comments so they're not quite as um as uh um desirable for for folks so they don't make it into the top 20 although they're they're wonderful beautiful birds and um i will say in a birding festival that we had we had a canadian visitor who came and that was the the cardinal was their number one bird because they didn't it wasn't a canadian it was a, a south african excuse yeah. me visitor um, and that was this number one bird and you can see why they're gorgeous brilliant red colored birds um, so sometimes it's wonderful to see our uh, things that we kind of take for granted um, through the eyes of a, of a visitor who, um, who doesn't see those kinds of birds um, on a regular basis. So we are happy to send all of you a bird checklist. If you want to um, give Katie your email, we'll uh, send it, um, send you bird checklists um, out through the mail. We had another question. Um, and that was uh, to name the species that was on the sign. And I think at least one person probably knows that, mm -hmm. the Burning Trail sign. 
that marks all of our trails. And I'm not sending anybody anything for that. <laughs> <laughs> Diane Needhart, uh, guest kite. Laura Donaldson, swallowtail kite. All right. Tail kite. Yep. Tail so, kite. Good job. Good Everybody's job, y'all. Good, good job. Good job. That that um, bird was chosen um, to be on the, um, the sign. It's also on our FWC seal um and it's my personal favorite bird um just um so graceful and beautiful as it flies around and if you keep your eyes peeled right now they're extremely um uh active right now because they're gathering up in big what they call kettles um as they begin to gather into roosts to make their jumps to head down to Brazil. Because interestingly, swallowtail kites come from South America up to Florida and Southeast, used to be much more widespread to um, nest and raise their babies. And then they head back down into Brazil. So our, one of our favorite birds, so beautiful. Keep your eyes peeled for those, for those um, uh, black and white and, and very um, uh, distinctive tails. And in South America, they're called, I believe, scissor tail kites. Oh, it's um, a favorite of mine so, as well. So, yes. <laughs> if there, if there, um, uh, if there are any other questions I was going to ask, I was going to answer a, a kind of a uh, expanded portion of, of Doug's question. We focused a lot on birds, but my understanding is that when people come to visitor um, uh, entry stations, you know, the visitor centers on the interstates, that one of the very most common uh, questions that they ask is, where can I see an alligator? Yep. <laughs> Thank you, Jared. So, so, um, so it's yep. not just about birds. As I said, many other species of our interest and the ones that you can't see elsewhere are oftentimes, especially for tourists who are coming to Florida to visit, are the unusual wildlife that aren't found in the states where they come from. I definitely have a, a lot of family from up north that every time they visit, we take them to Circle B Bar Reserve and like oh, It's a beautiful place. <laughs> Prime place to see gators, that's for sure. Absolutely. So we did get a couple of other questions in, um, two from Penny. So the first question is, are you going to have the bird festivals reinstated for this winter? There are a number of bird festivals that are happening all around the state. And Anne, are you, can you look at your list? I know. Um, yeah, I'm trying to. We're gonna be at the, a couple of them. Yeah, there's the, um, there's an, well, there's not a new festival in Tampa. It's moving from Tampa to the Apollo Youth Center. Um, coming January. Um, the Photo Fest, I believe, is going to happen again in uh, the Jacksonville area. Unfortunately, the, um, the one of the biggest festivals in the country, the Space Coast Birding and Wildlife Festival, has been canceled. So unfortunately, that one's not happening. We are not doing, FWC is not doing or hosting any um, festivals in the near future. There are a couple communities that are in conversation um, about starting their own festivals. So they're starting now that people are emerging from the pandemic. A lot of them were on hold um, from 2019. So uh, they're, they're starting to pop up again. That is something you can uh, find on the um, birdingtrail.com and in our newsletter we um, usually feature some of the upcoming birds. Yep. There is a second question and I'm not sure if this would be slightly out of um, your area but are more of the South Florida WMD areas going to be open for wildlife viewing especially in South Florida? Are you talking about establishing new sites on the trail? Or uh, I'm not sure. I just want to make yeah. sure I'm understanding what the question is. Yeah. And Penny, feel free to unmute if you'd like. Uh, 
Uh, no, just public access. Um, so we have, um, and, and I, you said WMD, I, I, um, I'm, I'm not sure what, are we talking about our, our FWC wildlife management areas or was there a specific? I think the water management district. What, water management district lands. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I can't speak to um, the specific policies for wildlife viewing for um, other agencies. I know this, the, um, the South Florida Water Management District's um, lands were are very popular um, for wildlife viewing. And we can look into that and get back to you specifically. If you will give Katie your email address, we're happy to, um, to get back with you if you have a particular place that you're interested in. So I had another question for you both. Um, are there any apps that people can use while wildlife viewing or in order to find places to view wildlife? Good question. Um, there, my favorite app, my new addiction is Merlin. Merlin is out of Cornell. It is uses the power of eBird. If you're not familiar with eBird, I would check it out. It's the world's largest citizen science project uh, collecting data on bird sightings. Um, it is a bird song app that if you're hearing something and you're not quite sure what it is, you can just put it on your phone, hold it out, and it knows where your location is and it knows what birds have been seen in that area based on that massive database of eBird. And I have not found it to be wrong yet. So it is a wonderful resource if you're out looking at um, or, or you know something's out there, you can't see it yet, but you can hear it uh, to help identify. iNaturalist is another great app for identification of um, plant and animal species, butterflies in particular. If you're not familiar with that, you snap a picture of what you want to identify, you upload it into the system, it gives you an idea of what it is, or it comes right out and says, this is so-and-so, and then it's curated by the community. The community can pop in and say, nope, I'm not sure that's this species, we're, we're pretty sure it's this species. So it gets curated and, um, and narrow down to what it is. For me, doing moths, I'm a mother, and it is hard sometimes to identify the moth species. So snapping a picture of it, and you'll get a couple weeks of conversation back and forth on what species of moth that would be. And it's also a learning thing because I learn more about what they're saying about, well, this one has this, and this one has that. So. Um, as for going where to go wildlife viewing, um, I am not aware of one that's updated. We had an old app that is still out there, but it hasn't been updated in a long time that would take you to um, different places. Well, our, our, um, our trip is, planner that, and yeah. sorry for, for jumping on you, and, uh, our trip planner does, as she was saying, does yeah. um, earlier, does provide it, it you is, with guidance on uh, what, you, if you enter, say, right. swallowtail kite, um, it would right. take you to all the particular places where a swallowtail kite would be likely to be seen. eBird, again, is a great resource yeah. as well. Um, and if you uh, take Google that, take a look at that, um, eBird will um, give you hotspots um, and will give you, you can, you can search for um, different things and you can pull up the map and you can see all the different um, uh, levels of, of heat maps, red being where there's the most bird, birders going to see and upload bird checklists. Um, not necessarily the greatest burning spot in the world, but it's likely to be um, if it's red. 
um, because lots of people go there. But there's many, many more places than that where you may find really sweet spots to see birds, um, in particular with eBird. Um, and it's, it's a great tool. Yes, and our trip planner on our website and eBird are both mobile enabled, so it can it can serve as a um, and kind of an app from the website. Awesome, thank you guys. Um, I'm trying to look down my list and see if I have any other questions I was writing down during your presentation. Uh, I don't know if you mentioned this already, but is there um, a specific way to become a Wings Over Florida member um, so that people can use the program at their sites? Right, good question. To become a Wings Over Florida partner, um, we just, well, it can happen three ways. We do online uh, virtual trainings that talk about the program and expectations of partners and materials you'll get, and then goes over a little bit of a primer of, of you know, some tips to um, teaching birding or teaching butterflying. So you could do a virtual training and we'll have those scheduled this fall. We also do on-site trainings, um, mainly for butterflies in the fall and the spring. Uh, so we could potentially coordinate an on-site training for um, a site staff, and then we would bring in additional staff. That's a two-part. We do the, the partner training, and then usually um, in the afternoon or the next day, we do a public tour. So we can kind of demonstrate how to take um, the public out on a, a butterfly walk or a birding walk. Um, or you can just call up the Wings Over Florida coordinator, which is Travis Blunden. Um, if you just get in touch with me, I can connect you with Travis and we can do just a one on one for um, a new partner. So it's pretty easy to to sign up. The expectations are we just need the data back from you. <laughs> you know, we just need to know how many people, who's doing it. We want to track um, to make sure we're tracking participants in the program. So pretty easy to become a partner. Sounds great. Thanks so much, Anne. Well, I think that's all the time that we have today. Um, I want to thank you, Anne and Jerry, so much for those presentations. And I'd also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. Um, I will be sending out a survey later today for this webinar, and I'll also be sending out the recording on Friday. So if you have any questions, please send them to the Office of Greenways and Trails at floridadep.gov. And I know everyone who put their emails in the chat, I will get those over to Jerry and Ann, and they will be sending you a little goodie in your email soon. So thank you. Thank you all very thank much you. for attending. And Katie, thanks again for the invite. We really appreciate it. And, and we hope you all get out and enjoy the birding trail and enjoy wildlife viewing in general. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.